the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll go ahead with the roll call then. Mr. Denio? <coughs> Here. Mr. Sevison? Here. Mr. Gray? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Crabb? Absent. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Brentnall? Is absent. Okay, well, we'll uh, at this time, we'll just go ahead and jump right into the report from the planning director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Paul Thompson with planning. Uh, just a brief update on some of the recent board actions. On the August 10th, the uh, board denied the appeal and approved the CUP modification for the Miners Ridge subdivision or apartment project, not subdivision. And then August 24th, um, they continued the Livingston Concrete um, project to an open date, and that is to do some further environmental review for that project. Uh, they denied the appeal and approved the use permit for the Celebration Church uh, project, and they denied the Bunch Creek rezoning project. So that was all on the 24th. As far as upcoming board items, on the 7th, they'll have the MAC uh, zoning text amendment. That's the notification of MACs regarding zoning text amendments. They'll have the Bohemia appeal, uh, which is tentatively scheduled on September 28th. So that's when that'll be heard. And upcoming, not scheduled yet, Fallon Poultry ZTA, uh, extension of time ordinance, uh, Rancho Del Oro, that subdivision project in Granite Bay and the administrative citation and hearing process zoning tax amendment all coming up. As far as the planning commission, on September 9th, we're proposing to cancel that hearing. Uh, there's no items uh, for that. And on the 23rd will be the temporary ag event uh, zoning tax amendment, uh, the Cisco Grove materials processing uh, temporary use permit, and um, the CEMEX modification. And that, as you know, is on uh, today, but unfortunately we'll have to continue that uh, item because of a noticing issue. So that'll be continued to the uh, September 23rd agenda. So with that, if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. What was the appeal on the church? Did, what did the board do with that? The church, they denied the appeal and approve the Ooh, I see, okay, thank you. So okay. that one's ready to go. I will be probably absent from the September 23rd meeting. Okay. For Kathy's information. Okay, anything else? That it? Okay, well thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay, let me see, time-wise we're just about exactly right on. And so uh, uh, Roy, Roy Schaefer, is going to uh, uh, let us know about a uh, modification and variance in the uh, Lake Ridge subdivision. Thank you. The applicant is requesting the approval of a modification to the Lake Ridge subdivision final map, and the final map is dated December 1955, so it's one of the oldest subdivisions we have in Placer County. 55 years old since the final map was approved originally. And it is to reduce the mapped front setback of a 20 foot from property line to allow zero feet from the front property line in order to allow a six foot high concrete retaining wall to be constructed as a driveway extension to serve the existing single family residents and this proposal also includes a request to approve a variance to reduce the 25 foot front setback requirement from property line to allow zero feet from property line for the for variance. This shows, and this is in the staff report as an attachment, it shows the existing and if I go into this area here, 
is where there was a 280 square foot wood area that was part of this uh, off street guest parking and that has been removed and the new proposal is that this would be added in concrete and then the retaining wall is underneath that to support the structure and then there would be new steps put in down here it's a very steep uh, topography there to the front yard and all of this area here is currently concrete and it goes down very steeply to a lower level there's a 600 square foot garage down here that exists and in the top level is part of the existing single-family residence. This is two photos of the site <coughs> that exists now, and this shows the edge that is currently pay, uh, concrete, and it would be extended out. The 280 square feet was on this area, and you can see the concrete pillars that were supporting the uh, wood that was removed. And this picture really doesn't do it justice because this is a very steep driveway down and the lower level, there's a 600 square foot parking and then this structure up here is part of the existing residence. So what this approval would do is create a safe uh, off street parking, guest parking. And there are several of these already existing in uh, the Lake Ridge subdivision. <coughs> And the DRC recommends the Planning Commission approve the modification of the Lake Ridge subdivision final map and variance to the front setback subject to the findings and conditions attached in the staff report. And that concludes the staff. Questions? Roy? On the upper picture, on the upper photo, it, it looks like sort of a rough broken up foundation and then it has two two trees it looks like behind it on the upper photo okay is basically that rough looking if you sort of just follow that line at an angle just up above your point or just a, up up higher go up higher right there and then at a V angle coming down that's is that where the new wall would be it, it would be where the new surface to the parking, but the retaining wall would be, you know, under that and then well, curve around. Right, but that would be part yes. of it, and basically they just fill it in and then yes. bring it up, concrete it even with the road. Because so this was where there was, the wood was above it previously. And uh, there are, I think it is, six really nice oak trees in the front yard you can see you can see them in there. None of those would be uh, removed or impacted as a result of this proposal. Basically, visually, the only change would be the change from wood to concrete. Yes. <clears throat> and then the support would be underneath. You wouldn't see that if you were at the edge of the road. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Roy. Would uh, the uh, folks that are proposing the project like to talk? Hi, I'm Jeff Elmers, representing Marjorie Brote, where Ridgeline Homes Incorporated are going to be doing the project. Um, the, the biggest concern I have is just that the driveway is so extremely steep, and the, the lady that lives there is right around 90 years old, and she has an extremely hard time walking down that driveway. So in order for us to get this on here because she likes to leave her, her car parked at the top because she actually has a hard time driving down that steep driveway. So this is the main reason why she wants it. Well, it was there before and we're just basically replacing the same exact footprint. We're not going outside that footprint so any of the trees will not be disturbed or anything like that. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, is there any Anybody from anybody else who would like to speak on this topic? Okay, seeing none, then we'll bring it back to the commission. Any uh, further questions or discussions? Well, what's your pleasure, folks? Um, 
to say just having gone down and taken a look at it, this same kind of thing has happened several times on that street. It's really an asset because the street itself is extremely narrow. Creating a few off-street parking spaces aids to the flow of traffic through there. So I think it's, it's a plus as a reason to support it. Okay, am I here in the beginning of a motion or? Certainly, I would. No, you go ahead and I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here. I would recommend that we recommend to the board to approve the zoning text amendment uh, subject to the findings. I don't know that this goes to the board, but I think I think we we can just approve it. Recommendation forward, a recommendation to the board of supervisors for approval of the zoning text amendment. Yeah. No, I, I think you must be reading off. This is on page four of your, of your packet. Here. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wrong paper. I would still like to approve it. Recommend that the uh, Development Review Committee approve the modification to the Lake Ridge subdivision final map and variance to the front setback subject to the findings and conditions. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Just it may be for everybody's benefit, so at least we brought it up orally in there. Did receive a letter from. Katie farther on on it and I don't know if, if there was a misunderstanding on her part because I think she thought it was more of a fence versus a retaining wall for it but I just okay so that way it's brought up so did not think that we we have paid attention to it okay well thank you for that so uh, with that then I'll go ahead and call for the question I'll Carries. If there is anybody that would like to appeal this, uh, file appeal within 10 calendar days at the front desk here, and the appeal fee is $504. Okay, I realize that I neglected to see if there was anybody in the audience that had a public comment. Now you asked if there was. What oh, did I? <laughs> you asked if anyone else would like to speak, and no one spoke. No, this is uh, on anything. Oh, on public comment. Yeah, I skipped an item, I skipped a beat. <laughs> so I uh, see none, and at least we gave the public a chance to comment here. Sorry about that. For uh... okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is the CMX, uh, and apparently we do have to vote to continue that. Or yeah, that's correct, and, and I guess what we should do is wait until ten twenty uh, when the item is scheduled, okay. and then we'll have to at that point continue the item. Okay. So, a little bit of a break.
Okay, on the uh, CEM MEX uh, proposal, as uh, we're just going to vote. You want to? Okay, Alex, go ahead and give us a little insight here before we take action. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Alex Fish, Planning Department. Um, the project we were to hear today is the uh, uh, modific modification to the CMEX project. And unfortunately, uh, we discovered last week that our notice failed to take in some properties in Yuba County, and therefore we determined the notice is insufficient. Uh, so today we are requesting to have a continuance to a uh, date, and are we doing time specific, Kathy, at this point? Uh, so than 20 or? I think what our, our proposal is is that uh, we re-notice uh, for the 23rd, and I'm thinking what we'll do is it'll be 10.05, probably right off the bat. Okay. But uh, a full notice will be circulated from uh, planning on the date and time. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, we are requesting that the uh, matter be continued to the 23rd at 10.05 a.m. Uh, to be heard at that time so we can provide a complete notice, make sure we've met all of our legal obligations uh, to property owners in the surrounding area. And um, so we are requesting your... Uh, approval of that continuance. I would also suggest that in the event that we do have anyone here to uh, speak to the matter that may have traveled, we may want to take their comments, but I don't know if these folks are here for that. No, they're not. Okay. Well, there you have it. Okay. okay. Uh, and so the folks said no, so I guess the ball comes back to us. Huh? Yeah. Well, I, I move that we go ahead and move it to the 23rd at 10.05. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, well, I'll call for the question. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, gentlemen. Guess we're going to take another break. <laughs> it seems like we just got here. <laughs> If you folks are waiting for the uh, huh? next, yeah, we'll be uh, doing that one at uh, ten forty, I believe.
Okay, I'll call the meeting back to order again. And uh, we'll uh, go ahead and start with our 1040 item, which is a uh, proposal to uh, modify a condition use permit for the Auburn Racquet Club. And we have uh, Jerry Haas, who's going to uh, make a presentation to us about this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me get through the slides here. Uh, the item for your consideration at this time is a modification of a conditional use permit to establish design criteria for two tennis courts in the northwest corner of the Auburn Racquet Club here in North Auburn. This is the vicinity map. The project is on the west side of Racquet Club Drive, just about 300 feet north of its intersection with Luther Road. This is the Racquet Club, I guess as a cloud would see it. It was originally approved in 1973 under a land development agreement. At that time, it was uh, a relatively small building and four tennis courts. Uh, over the years and through subsequent entitlements, it expanded to what you see out there today. This is an aerial view from 2008. Uh, in 2009, actually from 2008 to 2009, following a use permit modification and subsequent design review agreement, uh, these three tennis courts here were removed. These were converted into parking. This was previously the only parking area here. And uh, the buildings were expanded, and this tennis court was uh, located above the first floor of the building expansion in that area. This is the site planning joint showing exactly what's out there today. These are the buildings here, all connected. There's a tennis court above this building here. This is the new parking circulation through the site. And these the, uh, the tennis courts, outdoor tennis courts that are all lit. Uh, this is a close-up here of the two tennis courts in question. These are the lights. There are 12 lights in total uh, that were recently installed uh, with a total of 16 fixtures. Here's a <coughs> close-up aerial image, and I apologize for the lack of clarity there, but I wanted you to be able to see uh, the homes adjacent to the lighting. Th these are the two tennis courts, court six and seven. And these are the homes that are uh, primarily being impacted by the new lighting that's been installed out there. Uh, during the installation of the lights in question, uh, the neighbors along this property line here uh, submitted uh, complaints to the Code Enforcement Division, citing nighttime impacts from the lights on, on the, both inside and outside their homes. Here's an image of the lights. You can see them here. They're about 20 feet tall. Uh, again, this picture is not too clear. Um, let's see if we can get a better one here. This is looking uh, to the south, those same sets of lights. This is the fence uh, separating the neighbor's property from the Rack Club property. And this is a screen fence that's meant to keep light from uh, uh, leaving the site and impacting the neighbors over here. Here's the, uh, uh, an image um, from one of the backyards of one of the neighboring properties. All these homes along that property line are set below the property, the grade level of the tennis courts, uh, which kind of exacerbates the impacts of the lights. If you can see here, there's our esteemed planning director looking up at the lights here, 20 feet up, and then up an area below there. <coughs> uh, this is uh, an image seen from the second floor of one of the, of, of one of the residences. Uh, you can see the lights here. Uh, these really are the lights that are the primary impact. These ones here, if they're properly screened, don't really emit light back out this way. But these ones here and these back here are, are the most significant uh, sources of the light. This is the same view at night. Um, as I mentioned, there's where the glare comes from. It's from this middle row of lights and also from that far row of lights. And you also get a little bit of the glare from the, the screening, the previous screening that was out there that shines down onto the, the, the backyards of these properties. The issue at hand is that the lights have been allowed per uh, conditional use permit 107 uh, for years. They were just simply never installed on this site. Uh, CUP 107 was approved in 1976, and it allowed for night lighting, or for the installation and lighting of, of the four tennis courts along the north property line, and it includes the two tennis courts in question. <laughs> Condition four of CUP uh, specifically states that if night lighting becomes a problem and interferes with the reasonable peace and tranquility of the neighbors, uh, the use permit would be set for a hearing for possible revocation or modification to mitigate any undesirable effects. This is a nighttime view of uh, one of the two-story homes along that property line. It's not a 
multicolored home. It's all one solid color. This is the screen as it prevents light from coming out, and this is the second story that gets the impact from the direct glare. Staff, uh, staff determined on the first site visit that the lights were, in fact, an impact. <coughs> Following several visits to the site, both during the day and at night, uh, we were able to determine that reducing the height of the lights would, should be the first step. Bringing the lights down to, would increase the effectiveness of the screen so that the lights come down, the screen dark, the shading of the screen will rise up above these windows and um, help out the neighbors. I went into this house and looked out the window at night uh, with the property owner's permission, of course, and, uh, the, and the club manager brought out a scissor lift on the, on the uh, tennis court and held the light up, shut off the other lights, held the light up, and he lowered it from 20 feet, 18, 16 on down. When we were in that window, this window up here, looking out, we could see when the light got below the level of the fence and no longer shone or glared onto her window, and that was at 13 feet. We determined that at 13 feet, the lights would not emit significant glare onto the house. Uh, the next step we figured was to increase the size of the screens on this first row of lights here. So number one, we recommend reducing all the lights to 13 feet on these two tennis courts. That would be this row back here, this row here, and the front row here. Um, number two, uh, we'd like to see larger screens than what are out here. Since that time, the, uh, the club owner has installed larger screens, um, and they seem to be pretty effective. They just need to be made permanent. And finally, staff recommends lights be set on timers to automatically shut the lights off at 9 o'clock at night. According to the club owner, Jack Drimmer, who's here today, the courts aren't used regularly past 9 o'clock, uh, but occasionally used for tournaments and other events. Uh, so they would like to be able to override the shutoff and allow people to use those courts on um, certain cases from 9 until 10 o'clock at night. These three changes are specified in the staff report in the recommended modified conditions of approval. And staff has determined that the implementation of these provisions uh, to condition four would restore the reasonable peace and tranquility of the neighborhood. Staff recommends your commission approve the modifications proposed subject to the findings that are contained in the staff report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question concerning the uh, last of the three uh, uh, requirements uh, <clears throat> when they want to uh, use the uh, uh, courts uh, past 9 o'clock. What uh, requirements do they need to go through to do that? Do they just say, we want to do it now? Or yeah, essentially, or um, unless you have further direction, um, we would just allow, it would be an automatic shutoff. The lights up there would just automatically go off at 9 o'clock. In the event there is uh, a couple players who want to use that court at nighttime, they could override it up until 10 o'clock, but no later than that. So I think the remainder of the court, uh, the, the club, has a 10 o'clock limit. If I'm not mistaken, uh, okay. You'll be able to answer that when you're ready. The condition, the current condition four of the use permit, basically said that if the lights were a problem, they'd be revisited more or less. Is that then going to go away? We're going to keep it the same way. Um, I mean, so so the the applicant could then be just every time a different neighbor isn't happy with it, he could be changing his lighting system. I think from now, what this would do is. Uh, establish some peace in the neighborhood for the time being. Anybody who moves into a house adjacent to the club from now on, th these courts came in after these residents were already there, uh, which is why it's an issue. Someone else coming in to buy a house in that neighborhood, knowing those lights are there. Is still going to complain. Well, they may complain, <laughs> but there's not much we can do about it. We've already addressed the issue, we think, with this hearing. Okay. All right. Looks like uh, no more questions for now. Thank you, on. Jerry. Let me see. Uh, with the uh, question, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Jerry. Um, if they were going to light courts past the nine o'clock magic hour, are there any two of those courts that would be less offensive to light than others? If you were going to do that, in other words, what would be the best choice of those lit courts to? Let your, them use and keep the other ones still unused. It, it, yeah, your question is which of the two is uh, the 
less is, offensive. Is there two? Maybe there isn't any. I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, I, I would I would suggest port seven. Obviously, I think um, uh, these lights here, like I mentioned, these are the biggest problem, and it's particularly these four here that shine that way, that mm -hmm. shine uh, to the west. Um, so, you know, for, for, for clarification, I guess to put a finer point on it, this court really should be the one that would be used late if, if, if only one of them were going to be used okay. late. You answered it. That's good. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. As the, um, uh, the owner of the Ranker Club, would you like to make a presentation? Jack Drimmer. Thank you. Um, I think Jerry made the, the presentation. I just wanted to uh, address the question of when the lights might be on from 9 to 10. Um, because of trying to get along with our neighbors, we would not allow our members to play there after 9 o'clock unless there was either a tennis tournament or a league match going on. Um, the club is a member of the United States Tennis Association and as such, we hold five uh, sanctioned tournaments during the course of the year and a number of league matches. League matches means that our club plays another club. Um, those would be the only times that we would allow that to happen. With regards to the uh, sanctioned tournaments, we, that schedule is done a year in advance and we'd be happy to give it to the county, the neighbors, uh, if that was required. The league matches, um, a little bit trickier. Uh, there are different seasons and the schedules aren't determined until just before the season is done. It depends on how many teams, how many players and things like that and when our home matches are versus away matches. So to produce that schedule for those matches would be right before the schedule, the league would start. In total, between the five sanctioned tournaments and those league matches, I wouldn't expect that it would happen more than 10 to 15 times a year that those courts would be used for these events. And again, we would set it up that unless there was a league match or a tournament match was going on, uh, even though, even though we, we do believe that by lowering it to 13 feet that the problem is going to go away, but despite that, we'll, just for noise and things like that, we'll just say our members can't play there after 9 o'clock because there just isn't that much demand for tennis courts from 9 to 10 o'clock if there isn't a league or a tournament match going on. You see, is the... Uh, <clears throat> The 9 o'clock override, that's not available for the people out in the courts to do that? Is, that's controlled in your office? Or something? When, when those matches are going on, there is a supervisor, if you will, um, representative of either a team or the tournament there, and we would direct them about those rules and make sure that the only way they would be turned on would be for a league match or... Mm. Or turn. I was thinking if there's two people out there and they say, <clears throat> oh, it's 9 o'clock and there's a switch on the pole, or where's the switch that allows them to override it? Uh, I would have to bring up my director of facilities. Uh, I'm not that handy. Okay. The reason I'm asking this is because you said that you wouldn't allow. Oh, well, we would publish to our members through our newsletters, emails, uh, tennis director, a meeting with all of our uh, do we have a tennis committee that represents the tennis players at the racket club? <coughs> we would get that word out to ensure that, that they would not use those and, and use the override. I mean, okay. absent that, I, I'm not sure Matt could probably address whether or not we could do something with a key or something where a supervisor would actually have to be the one to, to allow them to be turned on. We'd certainly be willing to do that if it's mechanically possible. Okay, so, so you're saying that they are available out in the courts, the override, so anybody could turn the switch. But at 10 o'clock, what happens? You, uh, they all get a timer, and they're supposed to go off completely. It can't be turned on. Okay. That's the way it's designed. I just spoke with the chalets, and apparently there have been some issues where janitors are leaving them on after cleaning the courts. So, um, but we, that's, a, that's just a management problem. That, that we have to address. Okay. 
So, questions? Are, are you going to have to increase the number of light fixtures when you drop them down seven feet? Uh, no. Um, I've got specs here. Um, the interesting thing is, is this is a relatively new fixture that I just discovered in April of this year. And the lights that are on there now have um, older technology reflectors. So the lights actually have to be tilted up to cover the middle of the cord. These new fixtures have a new, newly designed reflector so that even though they're now uh, completely um, horizontal, that the reflector is what uh, down at the bottom of the light kind of reflects it, kind of goes around in an arc and then shoots it out the bottom so they don't have to be tilted up. My, my question was, you, you said that maximum probably 15 tournaments a, a year. 15 days. 15 days, 15 tournaments, so 15 days a year. So if there was a condition to the effect that you couldn't do more than, say, 18 or so, would that be an issue? I mean, is it pretty well set so you know the number of tournaments if you're saying you know, five major ones and then you're... Yeah, I, I tried to come up with an average. With regard to the tournaments, um, it's a factor of the number of entries. It's a, it's a scheduling thing. Uh, certainly, we don't want to go late. That's not our intent, especially because uh, three of the five tournaments are for kids and for juniors, and we don't want them out there till 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, but again, we don't know that until one week before the tournament actually begins, how many players are going to be in the tournament. That's when the deadline is. So I was just trying to come up with an average uh, because the factor is the number of entries when it comes to tournaments and then the league's registration goes on until a month before the season starts, then dependent on the number of teams determines how many home matches that we have. So it's, it's difficult. I, I was giving my best estimate that, that about 15 times a year is when it would happen. Or, or are they usually just weekends? The tournaments would be on a Saturday night. That would be the only night that that would, be impact, that, that would impact those two courts, only on a Saturday night, because they're two-day tournaments, Saturday and Sunday. The leagues are weeknights, uh, Monday through Thursday, typically. And so, so in that 15, I mean, we're probably talking about three tournaments and the other 12 would be the league matches. Okay, Ricky, did you get your question answered? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, um, I'll we'll discuss it later. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Jack. Okay. Okay, so now I'll uh, open up to uh, public comment on this particular issue. You, you know, maybe be before that, because he said he couldn't quite answer the auto timer, auto timer. Mm -hmm. That's Who, whoever can maybe answer that could come up and oh, okay. get that. We'll, we'll get to public in just a minute then. Public. Hi, my name's Matt Carducci. I work for the Racquet Club. I've worked there the last six years. One of my main jobs is to come up with contraptions like this that work and work for a long time. Um, the idea of actually having a key-operated light switch on those two courts would probably be the best thing with the timer. So it would automatically shut it off, which I believe is what one of the stipulations is at 9 o'clock, and the only way that anyone could actually keep it on past nine is with the key that would be available with the league representative or with the club manager who's on site still. So it wouldn't, the, the pers so two people or four people down there could never go and override it without management Good. okaying it, which would have to be a league or tournament. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now. Anybody that would like to make some public comments on this particular issue, you're welcome to step forward. Are you together? 
Yes, we are. Okay. 43 years. Give us your name. and. Uh... I'm Lynn Shalley. This is my wife, Donna. Okay. And we live at 1375 Rocket Club Drive, and that was the back of our home that in the, in the photos. And in talking briefly uh, a few minutes ago with Jack and uh, Matt, he has subsequently uh, found a 13-foot pole or a light fixture and uh, has offered to secure one, and we can run a test such as we did with Jerry and uh, Paul and uh, to make sure that it's going to facilitate our uh, problem. Yeah. Pro yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. so we're looking forward to that. I mean, it's just that it's, it's, it's been two years since the lights turned on. It has a big impact on our home, which everybody has noticed, and I just want to thank Jerry for such a presentation. I'm, I was wondering how I was going to convey that light <laughs> to you. It's, it's hard. But, uh, you know, even when we're watching TV in our family room, which faces the courts, we have that open light bulb feeling on this side here that kind of draws your attention and keeps you from focusing because that's what it's like. It's like looking at a light bulb that isn't covered. And it's because of those second lights, the middle lights that he spoke of, that go like this and then they shine on our home. And then when we look up, if you're just going from our family room to our kitchen, you're, you're looking into that open light bulb. And so it, it's just a matter of, like I say, if we can work that and get the lights where they're down and they're not shining in, that's what we're looking for. You know, we just, we just, we've lived there 30 years. We want to continue to live there. And it, it really has an impact on our house. And so we, we appreciate the county for helping us. And we, we, Jack has been trying to work with us. I just want to see something happen. Two years, it's, it's time for it to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay, is there someone else from the public that would like to comment? Good morning. I'm Jane Gruber, and I live at 1345 Racket Club Drive, which is on the northwest corner of Racket Club as you're going up toward the Shally residence. And although none of our yard actually abuts any of the tennis courts, the lighting that comes out from the side of the very back lights that border their, their place, that does the same thing when I'm watching TV in the living room. I get that light. It's not like I'm getting burned by it, but it's that thing in the peripheral vision. So I just wanted to concur with, with them in that that light does come in and become kind of an annoyance and a presence. So, so are you affected by the same lights that uh, we're talking yes. about here? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, so is, the, is the lowering of them, I think, would, would be an improvement over just putting the shields on because those shields only shield the light that would be coming this way as opposed to the light that's coming out on the other side, to the sides. Okay. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Uh, I'm Errol Linda Casados, uh, 1315 Racket Club Drive. Uh, my house is the second <laughs> one to the parking lot over here. So the lights that are on that court there are high and they shine right into our backyard and our bedroom. And then there's lights from this other side that sort of shine that way, and that hits a second window and on our side of the house. And when the lights don't go off to all night long or till 10:30, 11 o'clock, all that light is coming in to the house, and it stays very, very bright. And that's the only complaint. As far as uh, uh, noise of uh, the games and all that as long as they're uh, during the day and early evening the noise is okay but uh, uh, I think uh, there's a cart that uh, people use I don't know if they're picking balls or they're cleaning up the courts but it seems like instead of rubber wheels they're on metal wheels and when they drag them it's just like dragging one of those white elephant dumpsters, and it makes a lot of noise. And usually that happens around 
10 o'clock at, at night. And uh, I think that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. And as far as the lights go, uh, are the lights that are bothering you the same lights that we've talked about here in uh, Courts? The, uh, their Texas lights Center? are on this side, and their house is there. My house is right here where the, the new parking lot. It's the second house as you turn that curve right here that goes into racket club, the racket club. Let me see. I, so I guess the, you are uh, <clears throat> east of the racket club. Is that what we're hearing? I, I don't know east or west. I thought it was east. Southwest. Your maybe. house is uh, oh. in here. North. Yeah. Is that the yeah. one? It's the second house coming in. Yeah, this club, is the right? club, and it turns left and goes. Yes, you here. turn left, and it's the second yeah. house, and it's it right borders. The house on the corner, and then your house. Yeah. I don't know exactly which which right door above your place. Sure but there's a whole <laughs> row of lights, two rows actually of lights that, that are directly shining you know, into our, our uh, backyard. Jerry, can you go back to the overhead with that showing the houses there? There's a close up of this one too. I'm going to move forward a little bit. Okay, so uh, these are where we had the initial complaints here, these homes. The lights were shining off in this direction. The trees and foliage back here. But I think, is this your house here? It, it, I don't know. Is that, yeah. is that the one? Because it's the same. Is the second house? When you come in. Uh, Drive around the corner, racket, second house. Racket club, you're, you make a left turn. It's the second house from the corner. And that one gets the, the, the lights. And it Are, shines directly into the backyard, into the side of the house. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, I guess I'm getting the impression that this is the first time that maybe, uh, have you discussed this with the uh, Mr. Drimmer or anybody from the Racket Club previously? Uh, no, my husband has talked to him for something else con uh, pertaining to the easement, you know, uh -huh. it, and uh, that's, that borders the, the back of our house, that easement there, you know. But other than from the lights, no, you know, we, we thought about it, you know, because uh, when they stay up all night, when they stay on all night, you know, and stuff. So uh, that's, that's about the only time. Okay, uh, Ken, are you? Oh, well, uh, I was just, I was, I was looking. Are those, are those trees in the back there? Right here? Your place. We yeah. have a tree in our backyard, yes. We have trees in our backyard, but the easement has pine trees and, and uh, stuff that, that go, are there, you know, and some of them are, are, uh, have broken off and they're drying up and they haven't been removed and stuff. But uh, yeah, we have a, back, a, a tree in our backyard, but the light still shines in directly into the house. Okay. 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 Well, thank you. Is there anybody else? Oh, we have two. Come up one at a time, whoever's first. <laughs> uh, I'm Gary Page. I live at 1365, which is right next to the two-story house. And, uh, and I appreciate all the committee has done to kind of help the situation here. Uh, I could see when they were putting it together, it was going to affect the neighbors. And uh, I, I did mention it to Matt. Matt said they were, you know, well within their rights to do that. So I said, fine, we'll have to see what happens, you know. But I would like to go on record as saying we're not, we don't want to really be the bad guys. I'm not against progress, you know, progressing right along here and, and being good neighbors. I've always tried to be a good neighbor with a racket club, and they have. We built fences together and everything else. So I, uh, I would say like the last time that we kind of complained about some basketball courts back there, and they were getting there early in the morning. First time I've ever had any damage to my house. The three houses in a row there had all broken back windows. So the rocks were thrown over from only one area. I'm sure the racket club had nothing to do with it, but the people that were escalated, you know, not able to play basketball first thing in the morning at 6.30 in the morning really took a, probably a dim view of that. That's the first time I've been there for 35 years. So I, but I just don't want to go on record as being the bad guy. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, if any one of you individuals were living where we were, you'd be saying the same thing. So I just... 
And thank you guys for taking your share of that, yeah. the load for that, yeah. rather than just us, you know. Uh, so from what you've heard today, as far as the uh, way this issue is being dealt with, does it seem like it'll satisfy your concerns? As uh, far as I'm concerned, I'm a little bit lower than my neighbor, uh, you know. Okay. And, uh, but I think, uh, I think it will resolve the issue as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, but it, as, like I say, I want to continue to be a good neighbor and, uh, you know, work together, uh, I guess. Yeah, I don't think we've done anything. I guess the basketball court's not there anymore. Is that why? The basketball court's gone, but, uh, you know. Are the rocks I can, gone? I can remember, you know, you know rocks are still there, but uh, I got rid of my side. But, uh, but I just don't want to, you know, to be, we're, it's not like we're the only one making this thing right, you know. Yeah. Uh, County's making it right too. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we had one more comment. Good morning. Um, my name is Patricia Jensen, and my husband and I own the house at 1325 Racket Club Drive. So as you're coming down Racket Club, it's around the curve, and it's the third house. So we are right behind the tennis courts. Um, we rent this house to our son who has a four-year-old daughter and an eight-and-a-half-year-old daughter. The concern we have is that the lights are on very late at night. Um, the children sleep in the second floor in the back, and the lights are on. At 10 o'clock last night, the lights were on, and nobody was playing tennis. So I think what we would like to see is not only the action that you're taking – and this is the picture. <laughs> um, we would like to see the, the lights lowered, but we would also like to see a time limit in terms of how long the lights are on in the evening. Um, I think 10 o'clock is probably not a time where a lot of people are playing tennis, and I think it's a waste of energy, and it really disturbs the neighbors. So I would like some consideration for that by the owner as well. Okay, uh, let me see, as, as far as I'm hearing, uh, the lights will go off at 9 o'clock? Well, last night they were on at 10 o'clock. No, I mean, as far as, you know, once, this, once we take action on this, then that's what we'll be working toward. It would so be I'm just, better. I'm just checking if 9 o'clock is good. Um, with, with I guess a, that's fine. You with know. an exceptional times, maybe up to 15 times a year, you could have lights on until 10 o'clock at night, but the absolute off is <coughs> 10 o'clock. I think those times should be ten, uh, should be summertime. I don't think people are going to be playing at 10 o'clock at night in the winter, nor do I think there'll be tournaments. And things yeah, the, like the that. 10 o'clock is only when there's tournaments. Yeah, um, yeah. We would like a lower, um, an earlier time that those lights go off. So nine o'clock is yeah. sounds right. Be better than 10, so we could go with that. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Anybody else? Okay, well, with that, we'll uh, uh, ask Mr. Dremmer if you have anything further to say, if anything's come up that you want to address. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing and bring it back to the Commission. Any uh, discussion points? Well, it seems to me that... Uh, <clears throat> no, here. that the uh, stipulation that they would be off at 9 automatically and then just have an override from 9 to 10 manually, as I understand it, so that the uh, accountability can be followed by management as to who's actually turning on the lights and therefore who's responsible for turning them off. That seems to be a, a, a very valid uh, position to take. The other thing I have a question about is if you are going to test the new lighting system, are we going to wait until that test is done to see if that's going to uh, – <coughs> work and then approve that, or are we going to approve it blindly now, so to speak? What would our feeling be on that? Uh, our recommendation would be, uh, having been out there and seeing that the lights lowered to 13 feet would eliminate the glare, mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty comfortable that adopting these measures would, would reduce the impact or eliminate the impact. Okay, my question is, how many of the lights that are there now would be dealt with that way? All of them or just some? Yeah, condition for... Uh, specifies that all the lights surrounding both of these two courts, you've got one, two, no, no, no. three. Not two courts. That all of them or just the ones we're talking about? Uh, court six and seven. The other two have been lit for, for years and years and years. And no problems. No problems. Uh, these were the ones that really generated the complaints. So we focused this condition, uh, modification of this conditional use permit on these two tennis courts. 
That was my only question. Okay. Do, uh, I guess, do all the lights in the whole, uh, for every tennis court go out at 10 o'clock or just these two? Maybe that, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, all okay. All of them close to 10 o'clock. Unless there's somebody working down there or something because they need light and they turn them on. I have sweet dreams with one of them on all night the other night. The other night I those two. Periodically, they're on for some reason, whether they're working down there or someone turns them on. I don't know, but they stay on. We were wondering if there's okay. something. Well, just a minute, you know. Uh, yeah, we've closed the, closed the public hearing. Maybe, uh, maybe Jack, um, if you could come forward <coughs> and maybe just address to us the, uh, you know, the, the kind of the lights. Uh, it, it sounds like you close at ten o'clock, but there could be occasions where the lights will be on at nighttime. Beyond that, that but it would be for maintenance and that type of thing. Uh, um, what I'm hearing, we spoke before, that, that this is a management issue. Um, on those 10 or 15 nights during the year when they may be on due to the tournaments or the leagues, then um, our cleaning crew, they empty the garbage, pick up uh, any litter. Um, on those occasions, they might be on from 10 to 10.15 while they're doing that. The rest of the time, if they are on, that is, that's a people problem. And uh, Matt's in charge of those people, and uh, hearing this for the first time, um, regardless of the energy issues that are involved, we are going to take care of that problem. That, okay. that will not happen anymore. Okay. Not being a tennis person, I, you know, so I don't know when you're doing these tournaments, is it something where, say, through the day that it sort of narrows down to – you're using all the courts and, you know, say towards the end of the tournament when you're getting down to the finals and stuff, is it, does it end up at, say, 10 o'clock where you're only using half the courts for the finals on it, for the playoff, whoever the champion is? Does it get down to where it's finally just one court that you're using? Uh, that occurs on Sunday. Um, to whittle down to that, that's why I said that so e even though it's a two-day, it would only be the Saturday night of, Saturday of the two-day tournament. Yeah. Time now, time. That, exactly what you described occurs on Sunday. But sometimes, depending on the number of entries, we have to use them that late to get to that whittling down process. Oh. There, there's a, there are rules regarding how many matches a day uh, an adult can play, how many matches a day a child can play. And so our schedule is based upon that. Uh, um, it would be nice if we could shut those down, but then you'd end up asking a person to play three or four times on Sunday, which isn't allowed. And, and then my only other question, because it's not in here as part of it, is if we put a condition for a number of times so that way the neighbors are thinking when you're saying, say, 15 times a year maximum that a year from now it could be every weekend that they're on until 10 o'clock at night. Um, as I said, I, I'm happy to uh, if produce the schedule. Um, if we, well, you, you've sort of given us a ballpark. So if we said, you know, not to exceed 20 times a year. Uh, that's easy. Because in that way, it gives the neighbors assurances and not. Yeah, that would be. That, that, I think that would you be enough for adequate. You know what, what Mr. Chairman, may I make a recommendation? Uh, I neglected to mention early on that condition D, uh, or provision D of condition four, is redundant. It was in there. It was kind of inadvertently left in there. We could just replace that with a, a limitation on the number of days per year that the lighting extends to 10 o'clock. Yeah, that would be acceptable. Yeah. If it's okay, I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll address it. Uh, okay, any other questions for Mr. Drember? Thank you, Jack. Okay, uh, any other discussion points from the commission? Mr. Chairman, I'll move staff's recommendation that we approve the conditions as modified here today and talked about uh, with the, as outlined in the agenda. And, and the sequel findings. Okay. And so as modified includes a uh, 
limit? Yeah, the additional not to exceed 20 days or something like right, that. Right, 20 days maximum. Um, and the lights, yeah, be from all that. Ten. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that would on that would we would add that to uh, D, and it would specifically state that night lighting on courts shall not occur past 9 p.m. No more than 20 days per year. Yeah, 20 times. Okay. All second. Okay, so. We're clear on, on motion. and that would be on six and seven, and and then was it the commission's desire to put a limitation or a notification requirement to those property owners adjacent to the courts because we would be ready for a condition relating to that? I'm not sure I understand. Well, they're gonna, he's going to tell them when he's going to do it. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a feeling for it. I don't care. I, I mean, it's, we really it's never asked a very yeah, long yeah, ask our uh, citizens if that they feel. It's probably not going to happen most of the winter, so that's for sure. And, and it's Saturday nights we're talking about. Well, it could be during the week too. Mm -hmm. With the, it's the uh, at least what I'm hearing is the there's. There's up to five uh, tournaments that are uh, scheduled, and then there's an interclub. The main tournaments happen on the weekends, and the interclub tournaments happen during, during the, the week, days. Monday through yeah. Thursday. Yeah, mm -hmm. it covers both. Well, well, it seemed to me that uh, it would be make sense to uh, notify neighbors. On uh, when, when the lights are on, so kind of uh, nullifies the uh, concerns you know that we're hearing here with the lights were on till 10 o'clock last night. Well, if they are anticipating that, then uh, the issue uh, isn't there in terms of the tennis court and the neighbors having a conflict. So, well, the other thing is that uh, it would also uh, <clears throat> make it a little easier if the lights were left on to say, No, you didn't notify us, this isn't one of those nights. You know, if the uh, uh, <coughs> yeah. lights are left on and they're only left on 20 days, they say, no, well, that was an accident. That was the cleaning crew. That doesn't count. Well, if you're notified, then you know which days are going to count and which ones aren't. And so if they, it's one of those days that doesn't count, then they can talk to them and say, hey, wait a minute, we have a problem. Do you have a website for your club? Yeah. Do you post a calendar and a schedule on that website? I mean, wouldn't that be an easy way to do it? Is then at any point in time you could go check the calendar if it was a concern? Right, and then then that way too, and probably from a communication the point, they mm -hmm. can say, yeah, "Hey, either. you know, last night they were on till ten, and it wasn't a tournament night or something." Just so that yeah, way they help exactly. work with management. Okay, well we can add that to one of the A, Bs, and Cs, and say that it would be helpful if they posted the nights on their website that they're going to. Be up past nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. On past nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, with some to the effect that it shall include notification on the website uh, what what night's uh, tournament play is going to occur, and I think that actually works better because I don't know how we would determine which neighbors, how many neighbors get notified, how they how they're notified, that sort of thing. Um, this way, if it's is a concern, we can look at it. Yeah. Okay. So, so you we accept that into your motion then? Yes. Yeah. So we have an E then. Okay. A, B, C, D, and, and then now E. That's fine. Yeah. Is that Got some wording there, Paul? Um, just to reiterate, uh, on D, it'll be night lighting on courts 6 and 7 shall uh, not occur past 9 p.m., no more than 20 days a year. Uh, 10, 10 days per year. 20 days 20, per year. 20. And then on E, the applicant shall provide notification on their website of the uh, tournament and um, league, play. league play. Okay, sounds good. Website notices. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. 
in yeah, so. our second. Let me say I have one more, just uh, maybe uh, it's a clarification, I guess, that goes with the motion. But at least what I was hearing is we're only talking about the lights around 6 and 7. That's and correct. so there was some comments that came up that there may be some other lights that people uh, – other lots that now are bringing up lights, but at least from the county's perspective, what I'm hearing is those have been an ongoing situation for. That's correct. This this use permit only modification only deals with uh, courts six and seven. Okay, so those other courts will operate the way they have previously. Okay. Yes. Everybody's clear on that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make one comment too. It's. I really appreciate the neighbors and the owner because it's very seldom that we get the people come up here where they're really where you're working together and it's really makes it easier on us to to work with you and just personally I really appreciate it second that okay yeah, I'll second that yeah. thank you Ken okay well with that uh, we have a motion and a second, and so I'll go ahead and call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, folks. Thank you. And also, this uh, decision we just made is appealable. If anybody wishes to appeal, they have 10 calendar days to file their appeal at the front desk here in the building, and the fee is $504. Mr. Chairman, if yeah. I may, um, one of the items, the, uh, Ameri uh, the Accessibility Standards Workshop that's uh, scheduled for 1110, uh -huh. um, this item was originally requested to be put on the agenda by Commissioner Crabb, and okay. because he is absent today, Good uh, idea. it might be the Commission's pleasure to continue that item uh, until the uh, September 23rd when he may be the next one. Okay. Uh, I guess we need to take a vote on it, don't we? Or we would? Or just? That's correct. Okay. Okay, well, we still have a quorum here, so I guess uh, in terms of the uh, workshop on accessibility standards that was to occur at 1010, and I guess we're past that now, uh, I would take a motion to continue that to the uh, September 23rd meeting. Could I could I make that a different meeting than that meeting? Because I'm going to sure. be absent, and I am interested in that as well. Sure. Maybe that first meeting or meeting in October, whatever that is. We'd be happy to do that. that I'm not sure when when that will be, yeah. but we'll we'll make sure and get it on for October for you. Since okay. this isn't a timed item, we can uh, just have it added to the next available agenda when it appears all the board members will be present. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'll so move. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, uh, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, done. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the uh, 11 o'clock item, and this is dealing with some zoning text amendments on the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act uh, to uh, codify, I guess, differently in, here in Placer County. And so for this, uh, we have uh, Rick Urey. Yes. And yeah. So go ahead, Rick. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. Rick Geary with the Engineering and Surveying Department. I'm joined here today with Ted Rell, also from our department. He's actually our lead engineer on the Samara stuff that we do for the county, as well as almost all of the grading permits west of the Sierra Crest. So, and he's here to help me out in case there's any technical questions that come up. Um, the text amendment proposed before you, again, is for the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, which is part of the zoning ordinance. And what we'd like to do um, is to present a couple of changes that we've been thinking about for several years to implement. And so as your commission may be aware, Placer County currently acts as lead agency. Let me flip the slide. Uh, on behalf of the state's Office of Mine Reclamation to administer the Service Mining and Reclamation Act. And it's um, something that we've been doing since the act was uh, initiated back in the mid-1970s and our ordinance adopted it soon thereafter. Um, the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, otherwise known as SMARA, 
um, again, was adopted back in the 1970s, and California is unique in that we are the only state in the nation that actually um, allows local jurisdictions to administer SMARA. So uh, it's a pretty unique thing that we do here. Any questions? Was, it, was SMARA a national uh, then? Ted, is, is SMARA a national requirement? It is. It's a federal requirement. Uh, no, it's state. Oh, it is? It's enacted by state, yes. Okay. So maybe that's one of the reasons why California. California's the only yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so currently, because that we do administer SMARA on behalf of the state's Office of Minor Reclamation, we did adopt an ordinance, like I mentioned, and our ordinance is actually more stringent than that of the state's. Our threshold that to subject mine operators to SMARA is actually 250 cubic yards per year, where the state's 1,000 cubic yards. So we're actually four, more, four times more stringent than the state at this point. Um, to administer SMARA, staff spends about 130 hours per year on the nine mines within Placer County. Uh, seven of those mines are, are active mines, which take the majority of staff's time, and two are inactive. Here are the mines within Placer County. As you can see, they vary from Sheridan, Lincoln, Penranofer, Forest Hill, and Meadow Vista. And the two, these are all, all the mines that are subject to SMARA. And the two inactive mines are Black Canyon and Hoffman Pits in Forest Hill. Now, staff did make presentations to all the MACs in which these mines are located in. Um, four of those MACs um, were herded as, as informational items, and only one MAC actually heard it and voted to take no action. So, unfortunately, we have no recommendations from any of the MACs for your commission today. The typical tasks that staff does in administering SMARA on behalf of the state are you know, field inspections and reporting, and these are done annually, if not more than once a year. Uh, reviewing quantity cost estimates, reviewing financial assurances, enforcement and compliance. This, this particular one could involve other state agencies and other county codes like water quality and um, the Water Quality Control Board and stuff like that reviewing reclamation plans, and just general correspondence, may, which may vary from the county and the state and the county and the mine operators. So in summary, um, what staff is kind of discussing here today is, is to provide a consistency between our zoning ordinance and the state standards by increasing our threshold to match theirs. We don't see them changing theirs anytime soon and to collect a fee to help the county be more revenue neutral and to allow the county to continue to act as lead agency. Now this last, last, this last bullet is pretty important to note that if the county were to lose lead agency role in administering SMARA, it would go back to the state. And currently, based on information that we have from other mine operators and as well as the state, the mine operators will be subject to a fee about four or five times more than what we're currently going to propose. And it's probably because they're mostly um, officed in Sacramento. So to, for, for their group to actually cover all the mines within California, they use travel time, travel expenses. A lot of that might be overnight stays. Um, there are also different layers within the state that would have to be involved if we can't administer it locally. So, so staff recommends um, that your, your commission make a recommenda recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to change the current threshold from 250 cubic yards to 1,000 cubic yards, and to adopt an annual fee with an inflationary index to cover staff's time to administer SMARA. And we are proposing two different fees. This is actually one of the things that came up at the Ofer Penryn MAC uh, between the active mines and the active mines. As I said earlier, the active mines take the majority of staff's time, and that we've calculated out, and I think in, in your staff report you do have a fee study came out to about $2,028 per year per mine. In the inactive mines, we found that it takes about 25% of the staff's time, so we would propose that that fee be just 25% of the full fee. Okay. Well, on the inactive mines, what, what activities are you involved in there? That's a good question. On the inactive mines, we typically do, we still have to do the field inspections and reporting, and we have to do the general correspondence every year between, our mine, between us and the state and us and the mines. 
So with that, uh, Ted and I are available for any questions you may have. Okay. Yeah, one of the things you might, uh, I noticed a couple of those mines are on public land. So you might uh, give us some insight into how uh, the coordination happens with the uh, federal agencies or that okay. actually uh, probably have some role in those mines too. All right, so I guess one of, some of these mines might be located on state or federal lands and maybe Ted can help address that. Question. Yes, we have uh, several uh, commissioner, chairman, uh, chairman, commissioners. My name's Ted Rell, I'm, uh, as Rick introduced me. Um, and I know, Mr. Chairman, you've had some dealings with a couple of mines up there mm -hmm. when acting with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, in this role, the Red Ink Maid, Black Canyon, and Hoffman Pits are all within U.S. Uh, uh, US Forest Service lands. Our role as lead agency does not change with regards to uh, SMERA. However, the, we as lead agency work together with the U.S. Forest Service. F U.S. Forest Service is uh, lead agency for operations of the mine and Placer County is lead agency for reclamation of the mine. There are two, two different aspects of the mine. U.S. Forest Service is concerned on day-to-day -day operations and the county is lead agency in acting or enforcing SMERA is, is concerned about what's gonna happen at the end of the day when the miner's done with this property. That's how we work uh, in conjunction. And uh, the Office of Mine Reclamation does have an, an MOU with the Forest Service and with uh, the, the counties within the state to work together on this aspect of the mines. On the uh, environmental documentation that's required, if it's required, it'd probably be mainly on new mines, I imagine, but is there, uh, do they do two or do you, do you somehow combine the environment? We combine them. The latest one that we went through was um, the Red Ink Maid Mine with uh, Mr. Sakura. And at the time, the planning director, Mr. Fred Yeager, had made a decision to uh, not require a use permit because it was encompassed on Forest Service land. So what we did was we approved just the reclamation plan uh, through the zoning administration, uh, it, zoning administrators. But if we did have a new mine that came in, a new mine application that was subject to SMERA, there would be um, an environmental do uh, documentation. We'd go through some level of environmental review. And of course, all agencies involved, and especially the US Forest Service in this case, or BLM, if it was on BLM land, would, have the, uh, would be distributed the environmental document for their comment. I, I guess what my question is, under the federal rules, they follow NEPA. That's correct. And then the state rules that follow CEQA. That's correct. And so there would actually be two documents or is there? There would be, there would be one for the operational and one for the reclamation. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? <clears throat> yeah, could you explain what would, purpose would be served by moving it from 250 yards to 1,000 yards? What difference would it actually make to well, with the current mines that we have uh, subject to SMARA, it wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't knock off any of the mines that we have on the list off the list. Mm -hmm. But what would, it would help us, you know, explain our code to mine operators better and to help, it, help us implement it better. It just increases the threshold to be consistent with state standards. It really doesn't change any of these because they do more than 250 cubic yards. Actually, they, they probably do more than 1,000 cubic yards per year, so it doesn't change their status. So there wouldn't be any mines that could come in at 500 and not be subject to it? I don't believe so. Not currently on the list. No, not currently. What, what this change really is about is that um, we want to be consistent with the state, uh, the state law that says uh, 1,000 cubic yards or an acre of disturbance. Our ordinance uh, is, is currently 250 cubic yards, so it would be advantageous for um, recreational miners to for this, this uh, change to happen because if they exceed the 250 cubic yard threshold, they need a grading permit anyway. And if, if there's, uh, if, if we, through a grading permit, we can um, take a look at any environmental aspects because it still has to be either exempt from SMERA or it'll have some level of, of environmental review. So between that 250 and 999 cubic yards, a recreational miner would not be subject to SMERA, but they would still be subject to our grading permit rules. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't be like they just basically drop off the list and get 
carte blanche, you guys still take a look at what they're doing. If they exceed 250 cubic yards, absolutely. How do you check that? I'm sorry? How, how do you do that? How do you check if they're going 300 instead of 180? Well, we're, we're a um, complaint-based okay. system. So complaint, you don't go out regularly? No, no. We would either we'd find it arbitrarily or somebody would complain or <laughs> in like all cases, I, I would hope that they would come in and, and inquire with the county. If see, the gradient permit wouldn't apply on public lands, would it, or would it? No, it would not. Yeah. We do not have jurisdiction on public lands. Any other questions? It, yeah, I guess. Uh, as I think back <laughs> a long time ago when we first put the mining ordinance uh, in place, I remember Joe Chevro was front and center and got involved very heavily. Uh, is there anyone acting in that role these days, or is this strictly the county uh, doing this without much input from? Well, you said you already said the max didn't comment, but uh, but there's no one in the industry per se, say from Chevro or someone like that, or Robinson or any of these people that are making comment at all. Yeah, actually we have received comments and Ted has Ted corresponds with all these folks regularly mm -hmm. and they're they know about what could happen if we lose lead agency ship. So currently they're kind of saying, yeah, you know, maybe it's not a bad idea that the county implement a fee so they, they continue to to, you know, act as lead for the Office of Mine Reclamation. If we do lose it, like I mentioned earlier, the state has been saying and I, at least one of these guys works Solely and solely for the state as well, in another mine that they own, it's four to five times more expensive per year, and that's that's a huge financial impact, on, especially on some of the smaller mines. Yeah, but the state's budget's way worse than ours. <laughs> <laughs> what what Rick I think is referring to is that um, uh, Mr. Brian King that works uh, for Tykert, um, he manages uh, the Cool Quarry. And uh, Chevro has just, uh, Tykert has taken over Chevro now. And so when I visited him this year, he has, uh, he also manages a mine that's in Yuba County. And Yuba County uh, lost their lead agency ship. And so the State Mining and Geology Board now have authority over the, uh, the SMARA program. And he confirmed that, that uh, the state has phenomenal fees. And he said he would be present uh, if the, uh, Planning Commission recommends we move forward, he would be present at the Board of Supervisors to to give his input on, on what the impact would be to the miners in the county. And like Rick said, this is uh, state of California is the only state in the union that allows local jurisdictions to have authority over the uh, reclamation program. And, you know, we'd like to keep that relationship with the constituents of the county too as well. Well, I would certainly encourage that. I guess my fear would be that if they disagreed with the decision you made somewhere along the line. Would they come along and say, sorry, we're going to supersede what you just chose to do? Is that possible? Um, possible, I guess. Everything's possible. <laughs> Is it feasible? Probably not. It probably won't happen. Okay. Because also the state's encouraging. Um, I, I, if we have a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll give you kind of a rundown with the Office of Mine Reclamation in the, in the state is that uh, prior to, say, 2005, they only had about uh, nine personnel in their office. And so the miners in the state, they have a certain organization that lobbies to the state. And one of their issues was is that these mines that are encompassed in several different counties or several dis different jurisdictions, each dur jurisdiction um, they, they manage their SMARA program differently. And so the same mine is having to do the paperwork this way for this county, the paperwork for this way this county. And so that, got the, that, that word got up to some high levels up in the state and they actually gave uh, the Office of Mine Reclamation uh, quite a bit of money or funding. Um, and now they ramped up from nine to 27 personnel. And they're really, they actually have a task force now at the Office of Mine Reclamation, a group of people that go to each lead agency and they audit them and they say, how well are you running your program? And they have been, um, they've been ha urging us to start enacting uh, or get some fees from the mine operators who are doing business in the state so that you can run your, your program more efficiently. So they've been encouraging it. 
Thank you. Okay, maybe I just have one more question. And, and uh, as, as you mentioned, I used to deal with mining too, though you'll have to forgive me because after four or five years, my mind's kind of fuzzy on all this stuff. So I don't really act like I know very much anymore. But at any rate, uh, in terms of uh, public land and, uh, and the county, sometimes uh, the public uh, lands folks will want to have a miner post a reclamation bond, and the county probably wants the same. Is it such that uh, a miner is going to have to post two bonds, or is there a way to coordinate, or do you coordinate with that? No, the way this, the SMARA Act uh, is languaged is that there is one bond but the Forest Service is typically, there's one bond and the, uh, the um, beneficiaries listed on the bond would be the lead agency first and then the State Office of Mine Reclamation as, as secondary. With, concern, with mines that are on um, public lands, the primary beneficiary is either the Forest Service or would be BLM. Secondary would be the county as lead agency, and then the third would be the Office of Mine Reclamation under that one bond. Okay, so, so it's coordinated then. That's good. Yes. Yeah, that's good. And I will say that, uh, you know, being with the Forest Service, they operate under uh, a, a mining law that came about in the 1800s. And so oftentimes it was very... Uh, very difficult to get the operations up to the current day standards, but the uh, ability for the county and the agencies, the land, the public land agency to coordinate with each other has really made this much smoother and better. So yes, I think, yes. Uh, I think it's turned out to be a good thing. At least that's my opinion that I kind of remember from the past. So. Okay, with that, any other questions? Okay, well, do I hear a motion? Uh, Don't all jump in at the same time. Okay, I'll move a uh, staff's recommendation that the commission forward a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors for approval of the zoning text amendment as set forth in the above subject following findings. With the sequel finding, the zoning text amendment is outlined in the, in the agenda, and it includes uh, the sections as listed 17.56.270.E.2 and 17.56.270.K.7, period. Okay, any further discussion? I'll call for the question. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with that, unless there's a, something for the good of the order, I will uh, close the meeting. Thank <laughs> you.